the two skills for a salesperson today is under managing status, not information, not contracts, not promises, not features, not details, not benefits, status, because status delivers trust. The second thing is the ability to show expertise, not tell someone that you're an expert, but show them. That's Oren Claff. He's the author of Flip the Script, Getting People to Think Your Idea is Their Idea. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic and is changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show where I interview people who are changing the world and ask them how they choose from among the many opportunities and options in their busy lives. You know what I hate? That feeling you get when you're pitching something and trying to get someone excited about your idea or your product, but you have no idea if your pitch is working. It's a moment of vulnerability, and it's natural to wonder if the person on the other side of the table from you is thinking in their head that you're trying to sell them snake oil. My guest today, Oren Claff, has come up with a clever system to turn the tables in any sales discussion so that you convince the person on the other side of the table that your idea is actually theirs. Oren is one of the world's leading experts on sales, raising capital, and negotiation. His first book, Pitch Anything, was wildly popular with more than a million copies in print worldwide. In our discussion, he sheds light on how selling has changed over the past couple of years since his first book came out, how anyone can learn to sell like a natural, and how you can apply his new approach to sales, flipping the script, and your own pitches. On the line from San Diego, I'm joined by Oren Claff. Oren, tell us about Flip the Script. What's the big idea here? The big idea is that today, buyers want to buy. They don't want to be sold. People don't like salespeople. Uh, in general, most people I know don't like selling for the reason that buyers come in, they sometimes know more about your product than you do. Another thing is they have so many options. And so the first thing I ask you is, how are you different? How are you better? And that is nearly an impossible question to answer well and get further into a sale and convert. And the way things are bought has completely changed. But the way things, the way people are trained on selling, the way people believe they need to sell, the way enterprises tell their people to sell doesn't work anymore. I work with thousands of companies, tens of thousands of salespeople, and conversion rates are plummeting to near zero in some cases. So there's some very, very good sellers that are getting nearly all the business, then there's this huge gap, and then there's people working really hard to work without the skills of how to sell today is just frustration and pain. So this book really helps people, whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood, or they know a lot or they know a little, to programmatically get into an important sale, work through it, and have a high chance of conversion. So I don't want to meet with a thousand potential prospects, pitch them, and close 10. I want to meet with 30 and close 10. So that's really the big idea is conversion, not working hard and lean. One thing I've noticed, and I'm sure many people listening have noticed, is everybody's a growth hacker these days. And the, the low friction of reaching out to people, like go to a place like LinkedIn, where the number of pitches you're getting from people that are just asking you to buy a service with no context. You have no idea who these people are. You have no idea if they're credible. Uh, It really, it cheapens the entire process of selling. Like there's a lot of amateurish and low conversion stuff that happens. I wonder how it's even worth somebody's time to reach out to somebody like that. So there has been, because of technology and the the lowering of friction and communications, it just, you know, it's very easy to reach out to a lot of people. But as you say, you can hustle all you want. You can work all you want. And, and obviously that is something that, that, is, that is celebrated out there. But what's the point if you're not getting any actual closed deals out of it? You talk a lot in the book about establishing credibility so that you come in with a solution 
a pitch and the buyer believes you because you know what you're talking about. Now, I'm curious, can anybody sell anything? Like, can a great salesperson sell anything? Or do you really have to pick your battles and sell, you know, you have to sort of have the track record in the industry or years of experience in order to sell a particular thing um, that, that you are meant to sell? Today, yes, a salesperson can sell anything. The problem is when you go to sell a professional buyer, you have to sell to a buyer the way he wants to buy. And if he's professionally trained, you have to understand what his process is and, and adhere to it. How do you hire a great salesperson? What do you look for? Today, I think the way that you, if, if you're ignoring, hey, they've got 10 years or five years of experience in the industry, yeah. right? Social awareness, very, very high social acumen, acuity, because people can understand product information, right? That's just smarts. But today, creating a sale is about understanding the dominance hierarchy, that hierarchy in the buyer's organization. So managing the social structure. So if you think about, you know, a big sale will get closed, let's say, you know, a sale to Microsoft. And it gets far along, but it's kind of stalled out. They'll say, listen, if you guys are there, but you need that final little bit of proof, I'll bring in our CEO, CEO of Microsoft, right? To meet with you for 15 minutes. And he comes to the meeting and that layers in no new information, no new promises, no contract changes, no pricing differences. Uh, what is the only thing that that adds to the deal? Status, right? So if you think about it, status delivers trust, right? And so status is a social skill. Status is trust, right? And expertise delivers certainty. Is that fair? Yeah. If you have trust and you have certainty that what you promise will happen will actually happen, then you have a deal. So the two skills for a salesperson today is under managing status, not information, not contracts, not promises, not features, not details, not benefits, status, because status delivers trust. The second thing is the ability to show expertise, not tell someone that you're an expert, but show them. So as I said in the book, when you can show somebody with your behavior, with your language, that you've solved their kind of problem a thousand times over, a new salesperson to your organization should be able to create status both for himself and the company. And he should be able to show people that you can solve their problem rather than telling them. Can I, can I give you just a quick example? You know, just something that happened to me the other day. Sure. We're trying to buy some software, you know, or a plugin, or I don't care what it is, but we have a problem uploading videos to social media because Instagram has to be a 60 frame per second and Facebook is 30 frame per second and this has to be square and this has to be rectangle and this can't have words on it. And it's a cluster, right? Because you have one piece of media that you want to load up to uh, social media, but it has to be cut up all these different ways, right? And frame rates and everything. So... I'm, uh, I'm chatting with a company, with a rep from a company who says they do this, right? And, you know, I'm pretty technical, not that much about video, but I understand 60 frame rates, 59 seconds and 59 milliseconds, 30 hertz. You know, they lay out the specs. So I know the specs. I'm talking to the guy and he goes, yeah, we do it. And we're chatting uh, on the chat box. He goes, we do that. Yeah, but we need to upload to Instagram and then Facebook. He goes, yeah, we do that. No problem. I said, yeah, but, you know, do you do 60 frames per second? Yeah, we do. And can you do 30 frames per second? Per yeah, we do. I'm like, God. I just don't have the comfort because you're just saying, yeah, we do it. Yeah, we do it. So finally I said, listen, I like you guys. It all sounds good, but can you bump me up to somebody who's technical, who knows what they're doing? You sound like you're new there, right? And I just, it's not the money. It's just, I, I need to talk to somebody who's technical. So he writes back, I'm the founder. I, huh. I'm just manning the help desk. <laughs> That's great. What I really needed him for to say, right, is say, hey, look. Facebook, you know, has a 30 frame rate per second because they just implemented that standard and they're trying to integrate with Instagram. They're going to merge over the next year, but you do need to, you know, bifurcate these two streams. Um, you know, that's why you need to use our 23705 codec, 
you know, and get your MP3, uh, uh, you know, to match up. But the video does have to be split into two different mediums, uh, and you need the XYL MNLP codec transcoder. Like, oh, right, this guy knows what he's doing. So people do need to know that you have, and, and I would summarize that is most most of the times when salespeople are sell, talking about technical stuff, they try to explain to the buyer for comprehension. Buyers don't care, right? They just want to know that you know. You think I want to learn about an MP3 codec transcoder? Yeah. No. I want to know that you know. How, that's why I'm asking the question, not to learn how to transcode MP3 files. I just want to know that you know how to do it. That's why I'm asking the question. That tends to be confused in a salesperson's mind. But let's flip that around. Say I'm the buyer. Say I'm you. I don't have technical expertise. Somebody comes at me with a bunch of jargon. I don't really know if it's true or not. How do you spot somebody who's telling you the truth versus somebody who's serving you, you know, yeah, a, bunch of, a right. bunch of jargon? Because you're not throwing the jargon. You're putting it in context of a customer and a problem and a solution, right? So, yeah, this is the exact same problem that Patrick over at FOMO had, right? He's got a podcast like yours. So what we did is we, you know, we took his data stream. We said, Hey, Patrick, just put everything in the Dropbox. We took it in. We transcoded everything. We dropped it in. We stripped it apart, put it back together. We got frame rate 30 seconds, 30 seconds 45 seconds. We put it up the, at the uh, 45 gigahertz, which seemed like the average work for all the clients. We loaded it up. He's up on social media now uh, in seven different streams using one click. So that's basically how it works. Gotcha. So when I put it in context of an, another company or person, by the way, I know nothing Hopefully, we don't have a lot of sound engineers listening. To this. I don't know <laughs> anything about. It. I think the point is that when you put in context of another person or company, and you put in context of a problem leading to a solution, it shows them that you no no matter how deep the problem goes, you have the competency to deal with it. So, Oren, you do a lot of things. You travel all over the world. You're a salesperson. You're raising money for companies. You're writing books. You're speaking to audiences. What are you missing out on as you maintain this crazy schedule? That is my whole theme. Nothing. So I have a five-year-old. I take him surfing. We live by the beach. You know, we tra- I speak. We travel to Europe pretty frequently. I work out at the local CrossFit. Um, I have an endurance coach, so I'm running, you know, 20-some-odd miles a week biking 40, 50 miles, going across it five times a day, you know, taking my five-year-old to school, running, you know, this business, working on finance scenes, doing podcasts. I got my second book come out. What does this tie down to? Ability to get resources, pitch. When I need resources, I know how to go ask for it and get it and close it. And that gives all my time back. I don't want to work 10 times harder than somebody else. I want to work like Richard Branson, one call, one close, not 10 times harder than everybody else. So I don't, to me, that's the heart of my story, right? Is that the ability to pitch and get resources is real power to live your life. Your strategy, your approach to life is about making sure that you can get the best resources that you can in the most efficient way possible, which gives you the time and the energy to be able to do what you actually want to do in your life. And that, you know, that at the end of the day, this is a show about finding the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. And if you can do that, your your point well taken, you won't have to miss out on the things you want to do because you will have time to do them. Oren, tell us where we can find out more about you. Just go to Amazon and type in flip the script and it's, uh, you know, Oren Clap and it will pop right up. All right, perfect. If you liked what you heard, everybody, head to Amazon.com or your local bookstore and pick up Flip the Script. FOMO. And now it's time for the FOMO one of the show, the time in the show where I talk about FOMO and its role in pop culture or tell you about something that's giving me FOMO. And today I have a very special guest here for the FOMO one of the show, and that's Dr. Daria Long. Uh, Daria is a Yale and Harvard trained ER doctor. She's a Harvard MBA. She's a health and wellness expert on places like CNN and the Dr. Oz show. And she is the author of the bestseller mom hacks doing all of this, by the way, while she's raising two children. So Daria, I have to tell you, I just read that. It was a mouthful and I feel exhausted. You do a lot of things. So Hi. Thank you. <laughs> how, how do you get all this done? That's what I want to know. Well, that is, I have to say that cause I get asked that a lot. How do you get it all accomplished? And I get it all accomplished because these hacks that were in the book, I wrote them not because I was 
starting out as an expert in hacks. I wrote them because I needed them myself to get everything accomplished. So that's the source of them. And, and this hacks, you know, it's mom hacks, but I looked at the book. It's, it's hacks for everybody, moms, yes. dads, kids, the dog who lives next door. Everybody can use this book. The dog especially could probably use a book. <laughs> but no, I've had, I've had guys who say, can I just rip off the cover of your book so I can read it with my pride intact on the subway? I'm like, be a man, read on the subway with the cover. But yes, it's for everyone. And the whole point is, you know, yes, I came from this world of medicine and being trained to that, but... I've had my own health scares. I was I came down with an autoimmune arthritis when I was in residency and went from running every day to being unable to walk. I, I couldn't walk without pain and um, realized that like, I felt so in control in my career and I had this feeling of, I've got this, whatever comes in the ER doors, but I did not feel that way in my health. And then again, you know, when I, when I was a mother, so I said, how can I reverse engineer how I handle the chaos in the ER? How can I take lessons from that and that mindset to create a system that I can use in my own life? And and so that's what I did and really took back control of my health. And so doing that for everybody to make their lives healthier, better and easier. Sounds good to me. Uh, You know, since I have you here in the studio, I'm sure everybody's very curious to hear what kinds of things we can do to take control of things like our sleep, our exercise, our nutrition, all the things that, you know, if we don't get them right, make us far less effective and basically won't allow us to do the things we need to do every day. So, Mm -hmm. so give us some tips. Okay. So part of this was realizing when I started including like, yes, the best of cutting edge medicine, but also lifestyle and how much it all is tied in. And then saying, okay, most of us know that we should eat an apple and not a cookie. Like that's kind of intuitive, but yet we don't do those decisions that really are the more productive ones. Why don't we make them? And how can I make it easier? So I use a lot of design thinking, the science of habits and kind of resetting our body cycle to make health easier without having to use as many decisions. So let's say, are you a multitasker, Patrick? Um. Maybe. He, he's <laughs> as he like quietly raises his hand. So I mean, I am a reformed multitasker, and you know, you'd say in the ER, how do you get by without multitasking? So here's the science on multitasking, which we, uh, comes a lot from the ER literature too. Um, we think we're good at it. Our brains actually don't multitask. They are not simultaneously holding the two discrete data points. We are bouncing back and forth with them, which raises our cortisol, which burns brain glucose. Um, And here's some facts. It lowers your productivity by 40%, doubles your rate of error. And say you're writing a memo and then, ooh, ping, Nordstrom shoe sale, which for me like is like a, a dog with a bone. It takes 15 minutes to get back to the level of engagement that you were. So we actually don't have time to multitask. So here's the hack. I want everybody to start what I call single tasking or time blocking. So what I do when I had to write the book, you know, block out the time, turn off your email, turn off everything that could be pinging. Yeah, there's a lot of apps for do it or just do it yourself. I turn off my notifications on my phone and I set 30 minutes or an hour or two hours to just do that. And if in the meantime, any other thoughts come into your head, and this is what I do in the ER as well, don't get derailed. Oh, I need to go do this by Amazon shampoo. Have a pad of paper, write down anything else that comes into your head, set it aside, get it out of your brain so you can get back to the task at hand. And I use an app called Forest, actually, that a friend of mine, Nireal, who wrote a book called Indistractable, uses. And I have found that that really helps me because you, you basically start this app, it plants a tree. And if you break the cycle of work that you've created, say, 30 minutes, you kill the tree. So it's a great oh, way. I mean, you nobody wants tree. to kill a tree. You killed our love fern. Exactly. So so that I, I, I totally buy into this. Okay, next one. Okay, so how about we talk about one from nutrition? Love it. So we all think we're like super deliberate human beings, really at a high level of intelligence. Yeah, no, we are just like our cavemen ancestors, you know, and monkey see food, monkey eat food. So they did a couple different interesting research papers and studies. One was on the University of Utrecht, and they looked to see if there was a bowl of M&Ms, if it was right next to you or if it were six feet away. And they found that if it were six feet away, such that you actually had to get up out of the chair, you ate. 70% less with no additional use of willpower. And I really focus on that in the book and in my message and in my hacks that I give with people. I don't want you to use more willpower. Willpower gets exhausted. So no additional willpower. So essentially, how can you increase obstacles between you and the unhealthy decisions and lower the obstacles, lower the activation energy needed between you and the healthy decisions? Similar thing was from Google. They, you know, they give all the free candy and free food away and they People were eating too much and they didn't want it. They were, they were cool and googly. They didn't want to tell them to eat less. So they took the M&Ms, always M&Ms, right? They took them from being in a clear container and they put them in an opaque container. They didn't change the signage. They didn't do anything else. And in six weeks, their 2,000 employees ate some like 2 million fewer calories of M&Ms. 
the reality is, you know, if there's food on your desk, if it's women have a candy tray, if it's no opaque one, they eat half as much. The reality is, if we see it and we can reach it without a single obstacle, we'll eat far seafood. more. My favorite food is yes. seafood. Seafood. Uh, <laughs> I exactly. Have, I have a mom hack for you on this one, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, you know, anybody who's known me for a long time, when I was in high school, I lost 50 pounds. So I, and so I'm very careful with what I eat. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I'm on a plane, you know, they bring you that tray of food and you yes. see the dessert mm-hmm. and it looks good, but you know, it's not going to taste good. It's, there's just no, it's they don't, plain they're, food. they're, like, they're no, not good. Not. Yes. And so what I do is I put salt and pepper on top of the dessert. Therefore, oh. I have no temptation. Yeah. To eat. I mean, there's been times <laughs> when I like kind of try to get in there around the salt and pepper, you try to, like, eat around it. which is really when you know that you're in a, you're, you're pathetic. So, so that's my little hack. Um, I love it. Anything <laughs> you can do to, again, put that obstacle between you and the unhealthy so that you're not making multiple decisions. Our brains get exhausted. So how do you increase those obstacles? Like take that food, put some salt on it. Sure. Or take that tempting food, put it up on a higher shelf that you have to reach with a stool. We're lazy. Let's leverage that instead of fighting it. Let's talk about temptation because temptation (laughs) is not necessarily all bad. It can get you to do good things. And you told me about something cool with exercise. Yes. Of course, our audience is on something like, ooh, so this is the turn this is taking. (laughs) Um, They they may be a little bit disappointed. Um, But no, temptation bundling. It sounds very naughty. It's a great way to get yourself to exercise more if you're a person that's kind of struggling with that. So it came. And of course, you know, I love taking the basic science and saying, like, how can we apply this in our life? So Wharton had done a study and they divided people into two groups. And they give them all this addictive audio book novel. And half or a of the, podcast called or, Homo Sapiens. Uh, exactly. Hello. And uh, they told half of them, you can listen to it whenever you want, maybe when you're exercising. The other half, they said, you can only listen to it when you're exercising. You have to leave it at the gym. That half, that second half, they could only listen to it when they were exercising, exercised 150% more without ever being told to exercise. So again, it's one of those things that how can I leverage our human nature, innate nature to not have to use willpower in decision making. So temptation bundling says pick the exercise you're going to do. Run it. Maybe it's on the treadmill, elliptical, stairs or whatever. And then pick your temptation or your guilty pleasure. Maybe it's watching How to Get Away with Murder or People Magazine, one of my favorites, or some favorite playlist or again, that audiobook or podcast or whatever. The one rule is that you can only indulge when you are exercising. You know, the one thing I'm thinking here is You're like, laughing. All your, what are you all your guilty pleasures are like him, yim, and people. It's like, maybe my guilty pleasure is reading Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know what? Probably not. You do you. <laughs> there you go. Like... Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Alas, poor Yorick, while you're on the treadmill. Hey, if that works for you, listen, go for it. The people listen to the show is a classy bunch. We like those kinds of things. Um, okay, all of that <laughs> has, me, has me a little tired. So give me something to help me to sleep better at night. Okay, so this is something that most of us struggle with because for many reasons, stress and a number of them, but one of the biggest factors is our body clock and our circadian rhythm. Our circadian rhythm essentially dictates when we sleep. It also dictates BTW, our, our metabolism. There's some amazing research that when you throw off your circadian rhythm, people gain weight and even could, could test positive for prediabetes just because of wow. their sleep. So what is the, one of the single biggest factors here, circadian rhythm, is light. Because again, to our ancestors, we needed to be tied to awake when it's light and sleeping when it's dark. That's gotten thrown off today with our you know, Facebook and the interwebs and all you know, Netflix and everything you can do at midnight. So what I tell people is leverage light. And especially we have, you may have a lot of listeners, they're taking melatonin, they're doing all these things. Makes me want to pull my hair out because they are suppressing their body's natural melatonin. So if you are looking at your phone or some device late in the night, it takes 90 minutes from the time you turn off that device with the blue light wavelength, 90 minutes for your melatonin to peak and to fall asleep. So what I tell people is no device use for 90 minutes before bed. If you have to use it and you can wear blue light blocking glasses, those can help. Some studies have shown that the iPhone night settings actually don't help. They don't actually reduce the suppression of your melatonin. So that's not so great. So be very you got to be really diligent about that. And I still have to do work at night. So a lot of times, at, you know, before I stop for the afternoon, I'll print out something if I know I need to do work so I'm not looking at it on my phone. And then the other thing is turn off at night, the hour before bed, turn off your overhead fluorescents. You don't want to use those. You want to use bedside lamps that are 30 watts or less. Mm. GE and a couple different brands, lighting science, all of them have nighttime bulbs. Those don't have the blue light. Those are going to suppress your melatonin. Do it for yourself and your kids. I love that. And we talk a lot in the show about not having devices in the bedroom. So Mm -hmm. just another reason not to bring your devices into your room. Make that a device space. The Dr. Daria health hack prescription. There you go. Dr. Daria, it's been so fun having you here in the studio today. I'm sure a lot of people want to 
follow you, learn more about what you're doing, and, and read Mom Hacks, so where can people find you? Yeah, so they can go to my website, drdaria.com. That's D-R-D-A-R-R-I-A.com. I have a weekly newsletter and giving people some of my favorite health hacks, just two to three minute short videos just to make your life healthier, better, and easier. Or anybody listening can just email bonus at drdaria.com, and we will shoot them my new weekday dinner blueprint and meal plan, because everybody at t- Tuesday at 6 p.m., it's like, what am I making for dinner? What are we eating? That's the wrong time. That's when everybody ends up eating, you know, cold chicken fingers. So made a meal plan to make it super, super easy to be healthy for yourself and your family. Dr. Daria, thanks for stopping by. Thank you so much, Patrick. FOMO. Big news. You can now pre-order my upcoming book, Fear of Missing Out, Practical Decision Making in a World of Overwhelming Choice at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO Sapiens. While you're there, make sure to download my free gift for you, the FOMO Sapiens Handbook, which is an exclusive guide to spotting and managing FOMO and even turning it into a force for good. And as always, if you have an idea for the FOMO moment of the show, you can reach me on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, or on email at letsconnect at patrickmcginnis.com. FOMO Sapiens is part of the HBR Presents Network. The show is produced by AW360 and recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis. If you like today's show, please be sure to subscribe, rate it, and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at patrickmcginnis.com. You can also take the official FOMO diagnostic at patrickmcginnis.com slash FOMO dash quiz to find out if you're a FOMO Sapiens. FOMO.